We were the lucky country. We went camping on weekends. We played cricket in the park with the family. We spent time making memories that would last forever. Now, we have lost our jobs, our homes, our businesses, and our lives. Our state and federal governments have taken our rights away, destroyed our freedoms, and have been ruling by decree in the name of safety. This is not the new normal. We will not watch our country be run by bureaucrats. We will stand up and we will fight back. It is time to mark the day, the day that matters to every single Australian. That day is Freedom Day. On the 4th of December, we will rise for freedom over fear. We will demand an end to the lockdowns, an end to the state of emergency, and we will demand real leadership. The Liberal Democrats will rise for our day of freedom. We will rise to end the state of emergency. We will rise and take our country back. Will you rise with us on Freedom Day? Freedom Day, December 4, 2021. Join the fight for freedom. Join the Liberal Democrats. Authorised Jay Humphreys, Matt Worthy, Victoria. Welcome back to Liberty Chat. So Liberty Chat is our weekly one-hour podcast brought to you by the Liberal Democrats. We have a live stream as a special uh, treat, I suppose, for our registered members. And then, of course, we do edit and it is released on YouTube and Podbean for all your podcasting apps. My name is Kirsty O'Sullivan. We've got three esteemed panellists today, Mr John Ruddick in Sydney, our Leeds uh, New South Wales Senate candidate. Good evening, Kirsty. Uh, we have Mr. Campbell Newman in Queensland, our lead Senate candidate in Queensland up there. Now that sound didn't work, but hi, Cam. And we have John Humphreys, who is juggling a not very happy baby tonight, our national president, Mr. John Humphreys. Dr. John Humphreys. You're going to be wishing my sound wasn't working at this guy. <laughs> but, um, well, <laughs> there you go. That's I'm wonderful. Going to, I'm going to mute myself until he's behaving. Well, we do love a multitasking man. Uh, My name is Kirsty O'Sullivan, and as I said, welcome to Livy Chat, a very special edition tonight when we're talking about our wonderful Freedom Manifesto. I've been very, very excited about it. It's been a lot of work. Yes, there's been a lot of last minute changes. I've had a lot of emails about it. There was a lot of edits and a few little spelling mistakes, whatever. The policies are fantastic. We're going to go through each of the policies individually. So, and then at the end, obviously, if you want to put your questions and your comments in the chat box, at the end, we'll discuss a few more of your questions and hopefully get to the bottom of them and get some of those answers. Uh, So, as I said, we're going to go through them individually. Our first point being freedom from COVID alarmism, a really big one. And we're going to go to you, Mr. John Ruddick. Thanks, Kirsty. Okay, so obviously, for the 2022 election, the policy that had to be number one was COVID. OK, because yep. we I can't think of anything in history that we can really compare with this COVID episode. So I want to make it very clear what our, the Liberal Democrats policy is. We are saying by the 4th of December that absolutely all COVID restrictions, uh, uh, everything to do with COVID, 100 percent comes to an end. Now, some people were saying that that was not ambitious enough. But in fact, it is actually very, very ambitious because what we are saying on the 4th of December is, We're calling for not just opening the borders and ending the mask mandates and, uh, you know, treating everybody, whether they're vaxxed or unvaxxed, completely equally. We're saying to uh, remove the QR codes and to to not only remove them, but to abolish the data, which is a lot of people don't, it doesn't get much public commentary. But I mean, that was a really insidious part of this whole um, COVID episode. And these QR codes just sort of came in. Remember at the beginning of this uh, episode, we... Well, the government told us, download the app, download the app, download the app so we can see where you're going. And, you know, basically about 7% of Australians downloaded it, which I was impressed by. But then, and and there was public criticism of it. But then, lo and behold, we basically get the app anyway. Okay, Mm -hmm. now, this is the thing that we need to sort of, we need to sort of brace ourselves for our COVID policy, which is the gutsiest COVID policy in Australia. Mm -hmm. We are coming into summer. And you don't have to be a genius to work out that basically all around the world, in summer, COVID dissipates. Now, not always. In the, in the United States summer a few months ago, yeah, 
they, they had pretty serious COVID in some of those states, some of those southern states, Florida and so forth. Uh, but 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 generally speaking, what we're seeing now in Europe, we're seeing a big COVID comeback. Why is that? Well, because they're coming into winter. Okay. So what I think is probably pretty likely to happen is this: that we're going to um, next winter, despite having the world's greatest vaccine in the history of vaccines, we are going to have a revival of COVID down under. And what we are, what the Liberal Democrats are saying is. We're just going to soldier through it. And if we happen to have a very high uh, case rate, and even if we have high fatalities, we are not going to lock down again. We are not going to shut us, ourselves off from the world. We are not going to pull kids out of schools. We are going to soldier on. And we have to do that because if we get if we can't break this cycle, it's we're now, you know, we're coming up to the very unhappy second birthday of our COVID in January this year, which is just around the corner. Now, if, if, we, if, we can't, if we can't get through this next winter, because next winter is going to be the test, and we're saying to Australia, and look, I, I speak to most people, because obviously most people are vaxxed, and they just think life's got back to normal. Everything's normal. Now, I know the 10% of people who are unvaxxed, you know, they're feeling like it's uh, you know, pretty terrible right now. They're feeling like they're pariahs in, in their own free country. Uh, but, so, but most people think it's back to normal. Well, I'm telling you, the, the Australian media doesn't seem to want to report what's happening in Europe right now big massive surge in COVID. Mm. Now, thankfully the deaths aren't surging, deaths are going up, but it's not as bad as it was at the peak of COVID last year. Whether that's because of the vaccine or whether because the, vac the, the, the COVID's just sort of uh, diminishing in its lethality, that's a debate for the future. But we have to accept that COVID almost certainly is gonna come back and the Liberal Democrats say, we're just gonna we're just gonna deal with it. We're not gonna come, we're not gonna go back to any of these restrictions. So that is point number one in our glorious freedom manifesto, Kirsty. That sounds good. Give it to me in a one sentence line. What is our COVID policy in one sentence? We have uh, we have grossly overreacted, and we'll never do it again. I, I, I love the sound of that. Right. And number two in our Freedom Manifesto is about recall elections. And we're going to go to Campbell Newman. Take it away, Cam. What's our policy? Well, thanks, Kirsten. It dovetails nicely with what John, John has just referred to about you know, the phenomenon of the last two years. And uh, what have we seen? Well, we've seen governments um, uh, crank up the, the authoritarian sort of state with all sorts of different measures being implemented, new laws being passed uh, with minimal consultation um, and uh, during limited sessions of parliament and without proper scrutiny uh, that you'd normally get from the media. I mean, because the media has been full of COVID-19 stories. We've seen legislation such as the, um, uh, the new laws that allow the intelligence agencies and police services to hack into people's social media and change data. Um, that seemed to pass without any sort of public comment. There's digital IT legislation coming before Parliament for a digital identity system. And if you're a company director now, you've all got to have a company, so you've got to have a director ID number. And I do not recall my local member ever asking me, and I know him well, LNP, I don't know, LNP guy, I don't remember him asking what I thought of that one. So the bottom line is why, what is, how is government acting? Well, government have been acting within, um, with, with sort of um, gay, uh, gay abandon in terms of the things that they can do and get away with during this pandemic. And so what we're proposing in this part of the manifesto is three really good measures to actually try and get a sense of accountability back in our political masters. The first one is recall elections. This is something that many of you will have heard of in the United States, and it does happen, and it works in the United States. So essentially the way it works is that midterm, so you might have a three-year, a four-year, a five-year term, but midterm, if enough citizens actually sign a petition and call for a new election because they don't like what the administration's been doing, if you get the numbers, you can force a recall election. So it's happened in California on a few occasions. Um, and it, it was recently tried on in, as well um, in, in California. So if you imagine you're Daniel Andrews right now and you're trying to ram through this legislation uh, in terms of the permanent state of emergency, you might just think twice before going through with that one. 
A second uh, initiative in the policy is the idea of a citizen's veto. Uh, and this does happen in some countries. For example, uh, in Switzerland, uh, they actually put things to um, people in the various cantons because um, it is a federation. So, you know, there's some parallels with us, even though it's a much smaller country. But the point is, if there's legislation that is put through the parliament, essentially the citizens, again, if they don't like it and enough people sign a petition, you can actually reach a threshold where that can be overturned. Mm. The final one is um, uh, voluntary voting in elections. Uh, this is one actually that I certainly um, um, had a bit of a look at when I was Premier. We ended up not going through with it for various reasons, but it's something I think is, is really um, uh, an important thing to put forward. Why should reluctant uh, people who haven't taken an interest in political affairs be forced to turn up uh, to a polling booth um, and really not vote with the right sort of information because they've chosen to sort of, you know, psychologically opt out. So people are engaged who want to uh, perform their civic duties. What we're saying is those people, you know, should be able to vote, of course, but the others who, who don't wish to, why should they be forced to? So three really interesting and quite exciting initiatives that should actually get uh, people talking about what we're proposing. Mm, I think it's going to be very interesting at the moment. I've had a lot of people asking about it as well and how it would work. And certainly with the uh, voluntary voting is a really big one. And I think it's something that we've been talking about for a long time as well. Um, now we're going to go to a couple of the economic policies. Uh, number three being our debt and deficit. And we're going to go to our economics guru, Dr. John Humphreys. Yes, good. I should clarify with the rest of the titles of these policies, uh, it, it indicates, you know, that we're for recall elections or we're against COVID mania. When we say debt and deficit, just to be clear, to avoid any ambiguity, we are against the large debt and deficit. So very, we're, very against. We're, we're talking about that we are the only, we are really the only party left that wants to fix it. Mm. Uh, because I, I tell you, it used to be the cliche that Labor would spend up big and that the Liberals would claim to be the party of fiscal responsibility. I don't know if they're even going to try to claim that anymore. If they do, they should be laughed out of town. It is absurd for them to claim that they believe in anything like fiscal responsibility now. They have ballooned the debt out of all proportion. Uh, we are heading very close to uh, $1 trillion worth of net debt uh, in, in the next uh, year or so. Uh, and that is a, a massive amount for a country uh, of our size. So there is no party uh, for fiscal responsibility other than the Liberal Democrats. Now, I reckon this issue is a bit of a slow burn. Uh, COVID is a big issue. It is the issue of the moment. The way some Australians are being treated is unforgivable. Uh, so that is the issue of the moment. Uh, this uh, net zero and, and the government's uh, wrong turn on climate change is a, another big issue. Those get people's attentions now. I understand that. They should. Those are outrageously bad policies being done by the government. They should get your attention now. Debt and deficit is a slower burn. Right. It is, I understand, it's a bit of a more boring topic for some people. It's only us pointed headed economists that talk about it. But I tell you what, you're going to be interested once we hit the wall. Because the problem with debt is it seems like it's a banal thing, a benign thing. You take another step, you add a, another billion here, another 10 billion there, another 100 billion there. Pretty soon it adds up to actually a big number. Right. So, and, and debt doesn't seem to matter until you fall off the edge of the debt cliff. And the difficulty with that is, the difficulty to get into lecturer mode here, we don't know where the debt cliff is. It's like you're walking forward in the dark towards the cliff and we don't know where the edge is. And it is supremely irresponsible for our major parties to just keep on charging headlong towards that cliff. Somebody needs to have the guts to say, stop spending all the extra money. You may notice in this entire Freedom Manifesto, there is nowhere in there where we say, we're gonna give you more widgets. We're gonna give you more handouts. This is not for us an advanced auction on stolen goods. We are not promising to give you more and more handouts in here and trinkets and freebies and subsidies. We're not doing that at all. All of our policies here on debt and deficit is explaining where we're going to either not increase spending or we're gonna cut some spending. We're gonna get the departments to actually wind back 10% uh, across the board cuts to all departments except for defense and ongoing efficiency savings into the future until we can actually get this deficit under control and the debt under control. And including in that, 
10% across the board for departments, but including in that is 10% across the board cuts for politicians paid. Now, I understand, of course, in six months time, two of the gentlemen in this room with me are bound to be senators, uh, almost certain to be uh, some of Australia's best ever senators. Uh, right. They are included in that. We want to uh, cut pay across the board 10%. And that's because, look, sitting politicians, they are part of the reason we have this debt. They need to feel some of the pain. Mm -hmm. right? So we have a set of policies to try and get debt and deficits under control. There's a, a series of others and the duplicate departments. Mm -hmm. The Federal Department of Education doesn't run one school. The Federal Department of Health doesn't run one hospital. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of bureaucrats in camera telling a lot of people how to live. Uh, and I understand we're very unlikely to get the votes of those bureaucrats now. But unfortunately, <laughs> all of those extra jobs is sucking up tax money that uh, is not free. It's not available. Mm -hmm. Sending the country into a dangerous position. Uh, and we are the party that's going to put a stop to it. Yeah, and I think that's, um, it's not an easy sell. It's not very sexy, but I think the idea of cutting politicians pay by 10% is that that does make it much more exciting. That's for sure. Uh, now we're gonna move on to our next one, sticking with economics and something that I'm much more excited about is number four, our policy about low flat taxes. Um, John, can, John Humphreys, can you explain a bit more about that one? What does that mean? Well, you know what low and flat tax means. But, uh, <laughs> it, but this, there's two key parts. This isn't very hard to explain. Uh, however, I'll, I'll put it in some context. The current tax code is so big, no single person would ever be able to read it. If they just set it as their homework to try and read it every day and every night, you could never get through it. We have over 100 different taxes in this country and no human knows all of the rules. It is that complicated. So I'd like you to compare that complexity with this proposal. Firstly, anyone who earns under $40,000, you just don't pay income tax. Mm. That's it, a tax-free threshold of $40,000, meaning the people who are actually struggling, you know, all the other parties, they say they care about people who are struggling. If you are earning less than $40,000, you should not be caught up in the income tax system. Full stop, just do not pay income tax. That money is yours, you need it more than the government does. Mm. And then beyond that, once you earn above $40,000, a simple flat 20% tax. It's not complicated. Not hard to work out there's no loopholes there's no effective marginal tax rates going up and down like a you know a rabbit on meth it, it's uh, just a nice simple 20 percent flat tax and uh, the benefits of that as i said you know firstly the poor people and the lower income people don't have to pay tax but this benefit isn't just for the people who are getting a tax cut right you listening in you'll get a tax cut and that's great for you but this goes beyond that this is a piece of microeconomic reform that boosts productivity in the country lower tax rates are known. This isn't an opinion, they are known to actually boost productivity. And they do that by actually bringing more people into the workplace, by decreasing tax evasion, decreasing tax minimization, getting people to actually invest in the right skills that are best for them and best for the country. So we know there's a productivity dividend that comes from this. And that means at the end of the day, more jobs and higher wages. So this isn't just a direct handout to you now, it's also a productivity measure and it's one that's much needed. Now, the second part, there's two parts to our tax policy, is the company tax part. If mm. we're gonna have a low flat income tax of 20%, it only makes sense that our company tax should be a simple 20% flat company tax, mm. right? So that just uh, avoids the, the issue of people arbitraging between different tax systems. It's simple, it's flat, there's, there's no scope for messing around with it. Mm. And so that's the, that's the beauty of that. And combined with that, removal of company tax on reinvested profits. When a company makes a profit and they hand it out as a dividend, sure, they pay tax. That, that's what they're supposed to do. But when they make a profit and they reinvest it, when they buy capital, that is literally the thing that creates jobs. That is literally the thing that drives higher productivity and higher wages in this country. Mm. If you want more jobs and you want more jobs with higher pay, you want capital investment. So of course we shouldn't be taxing businesses when they reinvest their profits into new capital. So we would remove the tax on reinvested profits and that, again, is a productivity measure. Now, some people right now would pay less tax, and that's great for you. But in the long run, this puts us on a higher economic growth path, which, again, sounds boring now. But with the magic of compound interest, that means that you can expect uh, the, the next generation to have significantly higher wages. You bring people out of poverty. There is only one thing that has ever brought people out of poverty. It's not kumbaya. It's not socialists. It's not the government. It is productivity growth. And we have an agenda that drives productivity growth. Yeah, and I think that is the magic point right there um, because people always sort of talk about the idea of if we cut taxes, what about getting people out of poverty? You've just you've just made tax sexy and interesting, John Humphreys. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to number five. 
something a little bit interesting, I think, as well. Voluntary superannuation. John Ruddick, can you explain this one, this policy for us? Well, look, I think this is a very exciting policy too, okay? It may not seem at face value, but most countries around the world today have some type of concessional savings for retirement. And we think that's a good idea. People should, when we say concessional, people should be able to put, while they're working, put money aside. It gets taxed less so they can have it for their retirement. We're all happy about that. But in 1991, Paul Keating, at 92, 92, mid 92, Paul Keating made this big announcement out of the blue. He said, we're gonna force all employers to pay a percentage of their uh, uh, an employee's salary into superannuation. No ifs, no buts. And that has creeped up over the years and it's now 10%. Now, what we are saying is, is that we want the employee to have the option to simply tell their employer, uh, yes, put it into my super fund, or no, I would like to take that money uh, as PAYG income, which means the government actually gets more money because they get uh, they get PAYG tax on it. Okay, now, now why will some people want to do that? Well, look, in, in the line of work I've been in for the last 20 years, in, financial services, the people I often see new migrants to this country uh, on fairly low incomes, and they are incredibly good savers. And, uh, and what they want to do is they, they basically want to do three things when they come to this country. They want to buy a house, they want to educate their kids, and a lot of the time they want to start a business. Mm. Now, to start a business, you need capital. And these people work hard. They work, yeah, often have two or three jobs. And, and they're going to get a lot more income uh, because it's not just 10%, they're not going to be able to just save 10% more because, I mean, this is 10% of money that they weren't going to get anyway. So it's going to be a significant uh, 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 benefit to them. Now, the other problem we have with the, um, so it's, it's, look, if it's voluntary, who knows what percentage of people will say, I will take that money in cash now. We don't know. My hunch is, my hunch is it'll be about 25%. But I believe in almost all, all those cases, they will put it towards something productive, which as John Humphrey says, you know, the most productive thing they could do is start their own little business, become self-sufficient. And they're going to be have a lot, lot happier retirement at the end, uh, you know, when they retire. And they're going to be able to employ more people, innovate new products. Um, <clears throat> now, we, we do have to accept that under this system, some people, a very small number, but some people will take that money and feed it into the pokies or develop some bad habit. But we have to. Well, we but we believe in freedom. Now, people have got to have the freedom to make mistakes. Now, if people want to do that, that means they will have a more of a destitute retirement. However, overall, the economy is going to be a hell of a lot stronger and healthy with all these little businesses that will have started up. The other two problems that I see with it, what we have at the moment is, when Keating introduced this, it sort of regiments people into a career where they think there's that there's big business. I'm a little employee. I'm just going to go along the sort of the, the, the little elevator of life, you know, walk, work for the same company, pay money into my super, and they're just going to, and then I'm going to, we all looked after it at, at when I get when I get to 65 or 70, whatever it is. Now that, that just means that people become, uh, they just sort of become slaves to the system. Mm -hmm. We humans should be sort of thinking, what's the most dynamic thing I can do with my life, you know? And then super sort of traps them into sort of, it's almost like this sort of corporate serfdom. The other problem with uh, the current system, of course, is, is that it funnels rivers of gold into industry superannuation funds. Mm. Okay, and they didn't, and these run by left wingers, union members, and what they do is they basically then they've got billions and billions of dollars at stake. Okay, you know, it, the billions of play money, and they, and they with, with so much power, so much corporate power on the stock market, they can say, "Well, well, we'll buy five percent of your company because we've got you know a spare thirty billion. Uh, but, yeah, we, we want gender diversity on your board or we want corporate uh, cl climate change action or we want, you know, whatever the latest trend is. Okay, so it, it, it definitely, you know, it's empowering these um, uh, you know, you know, causes which aren't good for the country. Now, the other thing is that I would say about the current superannuation system, and because in my little business, I see every day, every day, I see two or three people's balance sheet. And, I, you know, I see what their income is, I see what their debts are, and I see what their assets are, which is you know, often superannuation. I truly, truly, what I see all day, every day is there are some Australians out there who make an enormous amount of money out of superannuation. And these are very rich people to start with. And mm -hmm. that is the bottom line. 
very rich people do very well out of superannuation and we don't begrudge them that and they should go ahead and take advantage of what the system is out there but low income earners you know they don't see much benefit out of this and i think you do, yeah and, and the other thing of course so much complexity with superannuation you know yes. they change jobs they lose they lo lose history of their account and it's just it's just another piece of paperwork to hang to, to, to think about and some people do it very well and some people on, on you know, average incomes can do, can do well. Oh, I've got way over time, haven't I, Kirsty? I apologise. I'll just look at my clock. I'm tired of it. So, okay, so I told I'm, you about superannuation. It's not yeah, yes, you know, terribly yes, okay. exciting. Okay, I will cease there. But anyway, voluntary superannuation is the way to go. It will be a great thing for Australia. Done. Number six, small business. Now, I think this is right up your alley, Mr Campbell Newman. Take it away. What is our policy and why? why is it our policy? Well, Kirsty, I'll start by saying at a very personal level, if there's a reason that I left the Liberal Party, it's because of their false rhetoric where they say that they're for small business, yeah. but they ain't. Yeah. So let's just explore that. Back in 1942, Menzies gave a series of um, uh, radio addresses and speeches uh, as leader of the opposition. And the one particular one that I draw on a lot is the Forgotten People speech. Mm. I think it was around May, June, 1942. And in that speech, he outlined what the what really, because the Liberal Party was still about to really be formed, uh, he outlined what that party really should be about. And he made it very clear it wasn't about big government. It wasn't about big unions. It wasn't actually about big business. And he specifically said that the rich can take care of themselves. What he said was he was supporting people who were the middle class, but people who wanted to uh, be self-reliant, uh, manage their own affairs, try and get ahead for themselves and their family. And that was the philosophy of the Liberal Party. But where are they today? Well, they're not. And particularly this Prime Minister has taken some of... Uh, this to the extreme. And I'm going to grab, ask my wife to grab my dog who's just decided to bark because it's dinner time. So it's we got, we got dogs, we got babies. It's all, it's all happening. Do a quick, this is Sassy, everyone, if you haven't seen my previous, yeah, it's disruptive. Good. Go away, Sassy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lise. Um, anyway, um, so the Liberal Party have departed from that. So if you want an example, um, there's some stats in the, the policy document. You know, between 2013 and 2017, a small business friendly coalition government has introduced 107, 885, 885 pages of regulation. Mm. I mentioned directors' IDs earlier. There's not, a, there's not a month that doesn't go past without some new edict from a government agency, APRA, ASIC, particularly the ATO. If you're in small business, you've been forced essentially to um, use, you know, single touch payroll systems and the like. It just goes on and on and on. And they really don't have a clue what they've done. And why is that bad? Well, small business should be, can be, has been in the past, the engine room of economic growth and most importantly, employment. John Ruddock's got this great stat. Correct me if I'm wrong, John. In the 1960s, 26% of Australia's GDP came out of small business. Today, it's down to nine. Wow. Yes, that's and great. Like, I don't know about you guys, maybe I'm needlessly negative, but I think one of the biggest problems today is in corporate Australia where we've got corporate bureaucrats, basically um, people who are not entrepreneurs, they're not uh, builders of business, they're risk averse, they're managers of the of, of the ship, you know, so they're not like someone who builds, who thought of the ship, who who conceived it, who built it after designing it and took risks to, to get it done. They're just the guys and gals who then, are, you know, the crew of the ship sailing it on a particular course across the seas and, and making sure that, you know, they don't hit a rock. That ain't business. That ain't going to take us forward. So there's a lot in the small business policy in this document, and I'll very quickly whiz through some of the key initiatives. Um, first on that issue of regulation, we want to see um, one in two out. And what we mean is every time a new regulation is proposed, the bureaucrats, because they're usually the ones pushing it, got to propose two to take out off, off the books. 
we want to see no retail trading hour restrictions. I've got to fess up here. This is something I should have done when I was um, the Premier of Queensland. I guess uh, I'm probably got an excuse. People always say to me, you did too much. That was your problem. So I'll hide behind that. We do evening. hear that a lot, yes. Yeah, yeah. We want to freeze and decentralise the minimum wage. What are we saying there? We're saying that the states who have their own unique economic circumstances should be able to decide and set a, a minimum wage because the economies are all different. They're in different stages of the economics, the business cycle, and they should be able to set their own wage. And we're also pointing out that, look, the, the minimum wage in Australia is incredibly high. If you go to a graph in there, there's a there's a purchasing power adjusted one compared to a whole lot of international competitors. And we are goal winners when it comes to looking after people. Well, that's great, isn't it? But it's also something that is a real drag on the ability to actually uh, for business to grow and, and prosper. And it keeps young Australians out of jobs. Occupation health and uh, sorry, occupational licensing certification. So there's all these rules and regulations around the country uh, that uh, you know you might have to have a license to be an auctioneer. But for example, I'm involved in an auctioning business, and in Queensland, if the business was here, um, we'd have to have an auctioneer's license. So we've chosen to go to other jurisdictions where you don't have to have them. But um, you know, wh why should there be licenses? For, for a whole lot of occupations. Cut green tape, of course. The excesses of government agencies. I referred to the ATO, um, ASIC, APRA. Um, we believe that there should be measures put in place uh, where there's actually small business and larger business oversight, uh, sort of um, regulatory boards, if I can put it that, or governance boards who actually sit over the tax commissioner and who actually can blow the whistle on some of their great ideas and not so great ideas. Uh, we want to make it easy to start a business. We want to see reform to employment law. I make the point that you knew the coalition were going into a bad, dark place when they started using the language of the left, talking about wage theft. Large organisations like Coles or the ABC, they don't want to actually not pay people. The reputational damage is, is too great. But they've fallen into this wage theft trap. Why? Because the, the system's too damn complicated and it needs reform. And the current government, the coalition government, doesn't want to do that. There's, there's other initiatives in here, like uh, consumers having the power to opt out of regulatory regimes in the financial services sector. Uh, small time investors, mums and dads, have incredible complex red tape, but protections for them but they then don't get the same returns the big end of town get, the, the richer people get uh, substantially lower returns on their investment products. And it's because of red tape and regulation. People should have protection if they want it. If they want to opt out, we're suggesting they can do that. Uh, we should see cryptocurrency um, classified as a currency. And we should also um, see that um, the implicit guarantee of financial institutions should go as Go as well. Now, I've moved very, very quickly through that stuff, uh, skimmed through a hell of a lot of detail. But there it's, is a lot in that policy. There's a lot, a lot in this area. Yeah. And it's, if you're in, in business and you're watching this evening or you're watching down the track, this is something you should really get your teeth into. If you like it, please tell the people you deal with because this is actually how we do get the message out. Yep, totally agree. And having been a sole trader and a small business owner myself, it's one of the reasons why I got out of. Uh, my previous career, but there was just like just continually added layers of red tape and rubbish that I had to go through. Um, and now we move on to the next policy. Number seven, something I know you're also very excited about, Campbell, it's our cheap and reliable energy policy. And it also makes me very excited because I do not like seeing my power bill. Campbell, what is our policy for cheap and reliable energy? Well, just to step back just for a moment, like if you think about Australia and its future and its economic future, what are the what are some of the big constraints, the things that need to be fixed? Well, I mentioned some before, employment law, the IR system. Uh, another one is green tape, which stops people building good projects outright or actually slows it right down. But another huge one, which is embedded in so much of you know, our, uh, our economy, of course, is, is the cost of energy. I mean, it's no accident when we had the oil shock in 19, 
70s in the 1970s that we then had inflation because it goes through everything. So we need to sort out the energy sector in this country. We need to take advantage of our natural resources, our fossil fuels that we have, and indeed other resources, and actually give or allow that to be a source of competitive advantage for Australian industry and, and business. So we're saying there should be a proper free market for energy. We should stop interfering. Mm -hmm. The reason we're seeing high costs of electricity, for example, for Australian families is because there's so much regulation and it's bad regulation and it's complicated and it allows the insiders to play the market and do all sorts of weird and wonderful things and make bigger profits. Um, it also creates uh, bad incentives as well in terms of the system. So, for example, in the last 20 years, there's been an overbuild in the uh, electricity distribution networks in various states, some not as bad as others, but it was because ultimately there was the wrong uh, framework for the sector. And it also meant that the executives at the top of these companies were getting more money if they made high returns on the poles and wires. We need to provide certainty for the energy industry. So we need to make sure that the government regime that's there um, is, is clear and straightforward. We need to get rid of the renewable energy target. We need to get rid of all these subsidies. We don't care what people want to put up. We're happy to go with renewables, but they've got to be reliable, affordable, 24-7 power. So if you want to say, okay, I'm going to plug into the grid with my solar farm or my wind farm, then that's great. But if you're going to bid the price of power, you've got to bid a price of power around the clock. You can't say, well, it's dark now. So, <clears throat> well, I've done my bit. We'll, we'll just let someone else deal with that. So we need a proper playing field there. And all these um, sort of various uh, uh, energy market or, or, or sort of... Uh, uh, clean energy uh, subsidies and regulations are actually costing Australian families. Uh, yeah. The final and big thought in this whole thing is we're saying, let's go nuclear. Yeah. Now, when we say that, we're saying that's up to the private sector. So let's be crystal clear. Yeah. We're just saying, take away the ban, remove the ban. Often when I get in debates with lefties on Sky News, they'll say, but it's not, but it's, it's not economic. It doesn't yeah. stack up. Well, I, they I always say, Mark, I, 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 it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting, Kirsty, because once upon a time they used to say it's very, very dangerous. Mm. Nowadays they mm. try that line. My response is, well, hang on, just just stop, just take away the ban, let them work that out. As long as they can, if, if they want to deliver and deliver it safely and deal with the nuclear waste, which is obviously a responsibility of theirs, then let them build it. So we're saying take away the ban on nuclear power. We're saying... Um, also stop any of these bans that are in some states like Queensland against going after uranium and let's take advantage of, of, those, of those, uh, those measures. I suppose my final point is, look, uh, many of us do not believe uh, in, in, in climate change or are sceptical about it, but that, that doesn't matter. We're saying here that we need a level playing field. We need to focus on the energy sector providing affordable um, reliable baseload power um, and, and energy for all our needs. And we did let, let, let the private sector get on and deliver that and get out of the way. That is, that's the main point, just get out of the way. Number eight, another one that's very interesting for me as a mum, we've, I think we've all got kids here. Many of us, many of our members have kids and we look at the change in education and what's happening there. And Dr. John Humphreys, I think this is a great one for you. Our policy on decentralised education, what does that even mean? Uh, good question. Well, at the core of the, uh, our policy here is simply that education is something that is too important to be left to bureaucrats and centralised uh, politicians and centralised bureaucrats in Canberra. Definitely. Uh, I approach this issue, and you can approach this issue from two different ways. And I think the one that's resonating today is, is more of the moral way. Um, so I'll, I'll start with that. And that is you look at the curriculum these days, more and more parents have had more and more time, uh, especially during COVID, to actually see what their kids are being taught. Mm -hmm. and, more, and more people are asking questions. They're worried about the direction uh, that the education system is going, and they're realizing that they've lost control of it. Average people, parents have lost control of the education system. Centralized bureaucrats and malcontents in politics have put us on a path 
that a lot of parents did not want to sign up for. And a lot of parents don't want to walk down that path. And what we're saying is we need to give more choice and more power back to the parents. Control of the education needs to be decentralized as much as possible, whenever possible, ideally to the parents, the local communities, the local schools. And that allows people to be able to opt out of the monstrosities being created in Canberra. But it also allows people, if they choose, if they like the current system, it allows them to choose that as well. We, we're not saying, uh, some people notice the problem that education has today. And there can be, uh, I think, a mistaken response that the left has got a control of the curriculum. They've messed up the curriculum. The solution is that we need people not of the left to take over the curriculum and we'll fix it. The problem with that is it's still a centralized curriculum that becomes yes. football. It becomes a plaything amongst the two big parties. Whoever gets power, they try to use it to be able to impose their views on others. If there's a bunch of woke crazies who want to run a woke crazy school, we should tolerate that. That is what decentralization and choice means. We're not trying to stop them teaching their work craziness to their kids. We just want to be able to have all parents being able to choose the sort of schools they send their kids to, the sort of values their kids grow up with. So mm -hmm. that's the moral point. And I think that's very powerful. I do believe it probably changed the governor of Virginia for people who follow US elections. I think that <laughs> it probably twisted on this issue that parents, uh, parents love their kids more than they're worried about left wingers calling them racist. Yes. Uh, and I think that, end up, that might end up changing how a lot of people approach the politics of education in the future. I would just touch on one more point though, and this is the boring economics point here, but I, I still will touch on it anyway, because I'm the boring economist. Uh, and that is a, a lot of, everyone says they want better quality education. Of course we do. No one says they want worse quality education, right? So we all agree on the goal. The, the approach that's been taken for the last decade upon decade has been, let's just throw more money at the issue. Mm. As we keep throwing more and more and more and more of taxpayers money and money we don't have, the grades get worse, the performance gets worse, the schools get worse. The quality of our education does not come from how much of our money the government can throw at their bureaucratic system. The quality of education comes from competition between schools. And again, that comes from decentralizing education, allow competition between different so sorts of private schools, allow competition between different sorts of public schools, mm -hmm. independent public schools or charter schools as they call them in America. Uh, I believe Campbell brought in independent public schools in, in Queensland. That allows there to be some diversity between different types of public schools. And then you can have choice between different approaches, different values, and the parents then choose between those different approaches and the better systems, the ones that work, get replicated. Mm -hmm. Competition works. It works in the marketplace. It works in governance. It works in education. A centralized top-down approach in throwing more and more money at it, that's been proven not to work. The only thing that'll improve the quality of education is to decentralize have competition, give parents to choice. Yeah, I am really, really excited about this one. It's probably my favourite policy out of them all because, you know, like all of us, I, I've seen like what I learned at school. I have two adult children, so I, I see what they did at school. I have one in primary school now. So I've seen the difference and the degradation in the curriculum and in the quality of the education in that time. And um, so, yeah, I'm really excited. I really want to get this policy. I want to, we need to get more senators elected so that will, any senators elected, so we can actually get some of this stuff right through. We're going to move on to number nine, free speech, a very big, a very big important issue as well, and something that, of course, we've been talking about for many, many years. Uh, Mr. John Ruddick, what is our free speech policy? Well, what we have done uh, at the, um, thanks to Mr. Humphreys, uh, Dr. Humphreys, he, he suggested, and with the policy committee loved it immediately, he said, look, why don't we just cut and paste the US First Amendment, <laughs> which, uh, which I'll get to. And that's precisely what we have done. And we have, and we debated it for a few moments. Look, should we, should we change the wording a little bit? And we said, no, no, the US First Amendment is such a magnificent uh, part of uh, constitutional history all around the world. Let's just say, yes, we, we support this. Are you and talking I that our policy is just a plagiarised version? Absolutely. No original <laughs> thinking into that one. But, you know, look, it really is disappointing that we have to have in the year 2021 in a policy document, we have to emphasise that we support free speech. Because, yeah. I mean, when I was a teenager and we're growing up, and you know, I grew up in a household where, you know, my dad made it very clear that there was very bad communists in Russia and China. And they were trying to take over the world and America was leading the fight. And, you know, when I'm 19, you know, the Soviet Union falls over and, and all the people are so happy about it. And they were all about suppressing free speech. 
I'm listening to this uh, podcast about the Russian Revolution now. And what, what, what did the Bolsheviks do the day after they came to power? Oh, they shut down newspapers and they passed four decrees. And one of their decrees was, oh, you're actually not allowed to sort of say anything unless we sort of, you know, say you're allowed to say it. So I thought that we'd won. I thought the debate about free speech was over. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, but it's not. You know, we had when we had the Rudd-Gillard government, we've got this 18C thing. The lefties can't help themselves. They've got this impulse where they just want to shut people up. And, 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 they, and they just can't help themselves when they get into power. They want to stop. They want, to, they want to regulate speech. And this is why we should be so grateful for what the Americans did 230 years ago. And what happened is when the Americans got their independence from England, which was in 1783, when they won the War of Independence, they got these 13 colonies and they said, OK, we're a united nation. We're you know, called the United States of America. But they had a very, they had, they'd been fighting a war. They hadn't had the time to think about what's going to be our sort of constitutional arrangements here. And they had this, they had this sort of inadequate system called the Articles of Confederation. Five years later, they said, look, we need, we need to have a more permanent arrangement here. And so, so this, the finest gathering of political thinkers since ancient Greece came along, Benjamin Franklin and you know, um, John Adams and you know, Thomas Jefferson wasn't there, but you know, he was still contributing. Uh, and all these terrific people, you know, uh, George Washington, of course, and they came up with the US Constitution. But when they drafted the US Constitution, there was a factional divide, like there always is in politics, between people who wanted centralised power and people who wanted more states' rights and more, more pro-freedom. Now, the Federalists, the ones that, the ones that wanted more central power, they won when they wrote the US Constitution, which was ratified in 1788. But then three years later, the other faction made the big comeback, the anti-federalists, poorly named, but that's what they were called, the anti-federalists, who were basically led by people like Thomas Jefferson. And they said, well, look, okay, we've got this US Constitution, which to be honest, the US Constitution is a bland document. That's just sort of the me mechanics of the logistics on how you run, run a government. Far more important than the US Constitution is the US Bill of Rights, which is basically the libertarians of their day and they said, we're going to amend this constitution. We're going to enshrine 10 things in this constitution, which absolutely are inviolable. We can't change it. Majorities in parliament can't change it but on the Congress. And so they and when they came up with this, this 10 list, this Bill of Rights, this glorious Bill of Rights, the very first one that they came up with, and I'm going to read it from our Freedom Manifesto, uh, we, we changed one word. The first word in the US uh, First Amendment is the word Congress. We've changed it to Parliament. So ours, ours is, Parliament shall make no law respecting respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right to, of the people to peacefully assemble, or to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So they put it in there. The good old Americans, those those glorious founding fathers, put it in there, and this is why. Uh, pornography was legalized in the United States, you know, around, you know, when it wasn't from around most of the world. Now, whether you agree with that morally or not, the truth is they set a good precedent there because they said, look, yeah, in America, you can say whatever the hell you want, okay, including pornography. Okay, and that that you know, they're saying you know, that's what people have got to be able to say. So we've embraced that. And we, you know, it's people think it's hard to get a constitutional amendment up in the because we're not just talking about passing legislation in favor of this. We're talking about amending the Australian Constitution to put it in as a, a, a now people say it's difficult to get constitutions constitutional changes up. Lots of lots of times the Australian Constitution has been changed. And you know what? I reckon this is one where the Australian people said, yes, yes, we support this. We do support. We need we need a majority of voters and we need a majority of states. I think we could do it. I think it'll make us it's good policy and it's good politics. That sounds very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. It kind of leads on to our next policy a little bit. Number 10, freedom from surveillance. There's been more and more and more surveillance occurring on us. Like it just needs more layers every day. Uh, John Ruddick, tell us a little bit more about that. What is our policy involved with that? What does it mean? How do we get freedom from surveillance? Well, look, this is a really, really tricky one because um, obviously technology is increasingly going to be part of our lives. I mean, it wasn't a big deal in the 1980s. You know, people barely had mobile phones. You know, they didn't have mobile phones in the 1980s. 
and people barely had computers. Now these things, I mean, every six months there's some new fantastic device comes out, and you know, then they're talking about all, you know, all just all this technology, you know, all this artificial intelligence. Now the thing about power, I'm 51. The thing that I have worked out about power in my life is this: if somebody has the opportunity to exercise power, they will exercise the power. Okay, so. Now, what the technology is doing is it is giving the state the opportunity to exercise a lot of power over us, okay, mm -hmm. which is, you know, we are going to end up in a, most of us will probably be familiar with George Orwell's 1984. Um, and, yeah, but really, I mean, we, we, are, we are heading for something that's sort of uglier, which is a high-tech version of 1984. So what, we, what the Liberal Democrats are proposing is that, you know, obviously technology on balance is fabulous. It enriches our lives. We're now talking on computers and Zooms. We've got, you know, Kirsty down in Melbourne. We've got Campbell and um, John up in Queensland. I'm here in Sydney, you know, and it's like we're in the same room together. Technology is magnificent. But what we need to do is we need to, like, almost basically have constitutional amendments to absolutely prohibit the government about what they can do with the awesome power that technology gives them. Because if it keeps, and there doesn't seem to be any public discussion about this in Australia. There's a little bit in the United States, uh, but I mean, if, if, if we keep going on this path, we're gonna end up having, we're gonna basically all be little, little ants. We're gonna be little ants with the government up there, basically knowing everything that we do financially and everything. So one of the things that we're proposing in our policy is, you, you might remember there was a big push up until a year or two ago that they're gonna stop cash transactions of more than ten thousand dollars and they said oh well you know look this is to stop drug dealers and this is to stop mafia and this is to stop criminals and that may well be the case that uh, those people uh, engage in large cash transactions but hell look the citizens have got to be able to have some type of commercial freedom without the government being involved and knowing that well what's going on we can't think that the government's meant to know everything the government's meant to be a lot smaller than it is citizens are basically meant to be free with a little bit of government on the side but what's happening now? Yeah, the fact they want to do this, and then they they're getting all this all this endless data. Now, another thing that we had some look, the policy committee was basically very much in favour of was um, advocating for the immediate release and repatriation of Julian Assange. Mm. And, and you know, I think the politics has turned on this uh, quite strongly. Uh, and look. First and foremost, Julian Assange is an Australian citizen. Now, normally when an Australian citizen, whether it's Chappelle Corby or who, who the hell ever, when they get stuck in a jail overseas, the Australian government basically takes the attitude, we don't care what they've done, they're an Australian citizen and we want them home as quickly as possible and we're going to send over our foreign minister and we're going to agitate for them and we'll, you know, deal with them. And but remember the heroin dealers that get killed in um, Singapore? Okay, Australian citizens, the Australian government, I mean, these are people that were bringing in bloody heroin to the country. Okay, but they're an Australian citizen and the Australian government said, no, Singapore, no, Malaysia, you can't kill these people. But Julian Assange is over there who got arrested over really trumped up uh, uh, charges. He is basically a journalist. The guy that gave him all the cables, like quarter of a million cables, not the guy, Chelsea Manning, of course, who's had a sex change. So Chelsea Manning, dear Chelsea, she, was, she gave Assange all the cables. Assange published them. The Sydney Morning Herald and every major broadsheet newspaper in the world said, oh, we've got all these. Here's, here's our trove from uh, what Assange. And there was the WikiLeaks party in this country. And they, you know, he had all the lefties said he's the superhero of the world. You know, do we love you, Julian? We love you, Julian. We love you, Julian. You're making George W. Bush and John Howard look bad. But then Julian Assange comes out. And he, what does he do? He uh, tells the world how corrupt the Clintons were in an you know, unbelievable corruption. So, of course, it's all about partisanship for the left. So now, of course, they hate Julius Hunt. Anyway, he, he, he did good things. And look, he's been in jail for a hell of a long time. So we absolutely support the, uh, the immediate release of Julian Assange. And, um, you know, I, I think this surveillance thing, if we want to think about what's going to happen over the next sort of uh, 200 years, this is the one to really keep an eye on. And look, the last thing I'll say on it is, uh, we want to get rid of these digital identity laws. I mean, this is, you know, when, when I was a teenager, the massive political issue in this country for about two years was the Australia card. Bob Hawke wanted to introduce the Australia card, okay? It was the first protest you ever went to, wasn't it, Campbell? That's protest right. The Australia that card. That is right. 
<clears throat> it was a big deal. Everyone's forgotten. And, about and what's so what so what's 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 a liberal PM doing introducing this rubbish? Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, we know because he doesn't believe in anything. That's right. He's basically mm. Labor. Um, and so yeah, so we're saying, look, we've just got to we've got to really focus on this stuff. I know there's other stuff going on, but we're saying, look, we've got to keep the surveillance state in check, and right now it is unchecked. Agreed. Uh, I think many of us have seen all those episodes of Black Mirror, but at least Julian Assange is getting visits from people like Pamela Anderson. So, you well, know, it's not all bad, right? It may be worth it. May be worth everything he's gone through, yes. We do have a very large um, free Julian Assange movement here in Melbourne, which is quite awesome. I can't believe we've done that all on time. I'm really quite amazed. Uh, we're going to go to some questions now. And I'm going to try and stick to them to, to policy questions. And I think whoever answers can answer. Um, Craig asks, what is the party policy on capital gains tax? Maybe this is one for you, John Humphreys. Uh, I have opinions on capital gains tax, but uh, I've got to be careful not to monologue my opinions and turn them into party policy by just uh, <laughs> them on this format. Uh, look, uh, Your opinion first, then. How about that? Because well, they're, they're um, in in a in a tiny little amount, like the two minute lot. I can give my opinion in in a two second one. Uh, tax is theft. Uh, but uh, to go back to the issue, look, there's a lot of policies we could pick. Uh, we have uh, picked uh, these policies to run on. Clearly, capital gains tax was uh, be implicitly cut in our policies. Yes. Capital gains tax being, if you own it for more than a year, half of whatever your marginal tax rate is. So effectively now the capital gains tax would be down to 10%. Yes. Um, so that's, it is implicitly cut in these policies. We haven't uh, gone over and above to write any further detail on that here. That does not mean that we're uh, a fan of the concept of any sort of tax. Uh, we are across the board. I mean, Milton Friedman, I think famously said that he never saw a tax cut he didn't like. Just Kind of on principle, we we are a party that will always look to cut every tax we can whenever we can find an opportunity to. And but can I? Can, yeah. And can I just tag on for everyone, John? And having been there as a mayor, the large organisation, and as a premier, I just assure you all that bureaucrats and politicians, you give them a tax increase, they spend it. Mm. Yeah, it's never enough. And you can even you can even go back to the the Tudor England. With people like Henry VIII and the, the other Tudor you know, kings and queens, they never had enough money because the moment they raised a tax, they spent what they'd got because there's always something else. You know, the, the, you have to put constraints on the, the revenue raising side of the equation. Now, uh, sticking with some of the finance stuff, Brett has a question and he says, what is your policy or perhaps idea? What is your idea about a decentralised autonomous government and the use of blockchain, the use of decentralised finance at a local and state level and tokens which form the sovereign wealth of the country? For example, the city of Miami has just launched a city coin. Well, firstly, I'm, uh, I love DeFi. I'm a big fan. And we've gotten this uh, in our policy. Again, we, we didn't go into excruciating detail on every part, but we did show you where we were trending by saying treat crypto as a currency, not as an asset, so that it doesn't get uh, ruined with capital gains tax, referring back to, I guess, the, the previous question. Um, I'm a big fan of DeFi. We need to make sure regulations don't get in the way. They are getting in the way of, de sorry, decentralized finance uh, is DeFi. Um, we need to make sure regulations aren't getting in the way of that. We actually have a burgeoning uh, DeFi blockchain based industry coming out of Brisbane, of all places, you know, our backyard for Campbell and I. Um, and I'm, I'm quite supportive. I, I've got to say, be a little skeptical when you see uh, governments come out with their official Florida government token coin or whatever else they come out with. Um, the Chinese government is getting big into uh, trying to tokenize or create a. Um, and e renminbi um, the, the whole benefit well one of the benefits of these things is supposed to be that they aren't controlled by a centralized authority so when a centralized authority comes along and dresses itself in the clothes of blockchain and bitcoin uh, be skeptical because that's mm -hmm. not the way we actually want to go the governments can also use technology in their interest we use technology to try and get around bad rules of the government and try to refree the economy they use the technology to try and clamp down again we're in a technological arms race uh, Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, and the various other ones that I'm sure everyone's about to remind me of which one's the latest craze in the in the comments threads now. Um, 
they are uh, on our side in this uh, technological arms race. Uh, not all technology will be, uh, but yeah, we're as a party very sympathetic to uh, a deregulated area of crypto and DeFi. And by the way, if you're interested in this, check out the RMIT-based uh, blockchain innovation hub. Uh, it's, uh, it's run by a bunch of uh, very good economists down there, including some. I mean, they they basically Lib Dem aligned. I don't know if they'd uh, like me saying that, but they're all functionally libertarian. Sinclair Davidson, Chris Berg, Jason yes. uh, Watts, wonderful people. We should get them in uh, to one yes, of these um, at some point. Definitely. Uh, maybe, that is that is in the works. We will definitely have our crypto chat very soon. All right. So they um yeah, if you're interested further in this, and they do much more than crypto, right? They do the whole blockchain. They do the whole yes. DeFi thing. So if you're interested, check out the Blockchain Innovation Hub out of RMIT. Yes. Uh, whilst we're still on that topic, Bill has a question. If crypto is currency, what about gold, silver, platinum? Where does it end? Well, it ends, well, I mean, firstly, uh, that, that leans back into the first question of <laughs> if, if we could eventually get to a point of uh, removing capital gains tax, it would be a moot point. Anything could be. Um, but uh, secondly, uh, if things are setting themselves up to be used as currency, we should uh, allow them to flourish. I mean, what we've got is a situation here where people say crypto isn't being used much like a currency, therefore we should tax it like an asset. But if you tax it like an asset, it can never be used as a currency. Mm. I mean, this is a bit of a circular argument here. We have to allow things that are attempting to be used as currencies to effectively be currencies. And if people are attempting to use proper gold and silver as a currency, then I, I, I am not against the idea of competitive currencies. Again, I'm, I'm monologuing somewhat off our uh, policy manifesto. Our policy manifesto is what it is. Mm. Uh, but generally, the idea of um, allowing people to use currencies other than the one they've been given by the government is, is something that sits quite comfortably with the libertarian ethos. Okay. Whether, whether that be, and I know a lot of people that are gold bugs out there, a lot of people who follow uh, Peter Schiff and various other uh, Austrian economists who accuse crypto of being unbacked, you know, everything's unbacked in some sort of metaphysical sense. Uh, look, I understand we're not requiring you to use crypto. Uh, so, you know, gold and silver, precious metals, that could be an alternative. Crypto could be an alternative. How about just choice? We, we don't have to require you to use any of them. We can just allow you to have choice. Yes, exactly. Uh, now, here's an interesting one from Nathan. And he said, he asked, we have seen the power, the police politicised and degrading of the separation of powers between the judiciary and the executive would a locally elected sheriff style regional police force be something that could or would work? I don't know who's going to answer that. Maybe Campbell. That's a Campbell. Um, Campbell yeah, well. Look, I, I, I don't think so um, because I think then if, if you've got elections for that sort of uh, position in a government, I think then you actually do have even greater problems with uh, politicisation um, of of that particular service, and I don't, I, you know, I don't like what's happened in Victoria at all. It's it's extremely creepy, particularly hearing about the, um, uh, the well, the revelation that that I think it was about sixteen or so um, Victorian Labor MPs were, were probably going to be uh, prosecuted by the police, but uh, from down on high internally, that was um, that was stopped. Um, so I, I, I don't really like the idea of elected law enforcement officials. I think it would only make the situation worse. Um, the Fitzgerald reforms in Queensland, much as many of it I hate, uh, not a lot of it I hate, um, I think generally we would see a cleaner system, dare I, mean, dare I say it, than what we've seen in Victoria now. I, I would be incredibly shocked if what's happened in Victoria happened in Queensland now, I, I just actually, I can't contemplate it happening knowing the way the system does work now um, post Fitzgerald. So I, I, anyway, those are my thoughts. I think we want a, an independent, professional, ethical police service in every state. Mm. Uh, now, this is an interesting one. We're changing the subject again, but an interesting one about education from Russell and he's uh, addressed it to John and I assume John Humphreys. And he says, if you make the curriculum the prerogative of each school, what is to stop the teachers unions from taking control of most government schools, which are already union dominated? That's, that's what we have today. I mean, that, 
that's that's not a big difference to what we face today. The, the government's very much influenced by the teachers' unions and then enforcing that on Absolutely. everyone. So the issue is like, it, if we just respond with trying to force my perfect view on the world and then Campbell's perfect view on the world and then JR's perfect view on the world, we're just gonna get caught in an arms race of trying to control people. The solution is to decentralize and allow diversity and choice. Now diversity will involve some schools being what I consider to be shit tier. Some of them are going to teach things that I think would be the wrong stuff to teach. Some of them are the schools that I wouldn't send my kids. That's what diversity means, right? That's what choice means. Competition has to allow different providers to try out different things. And a bunch of people with a nurses union or a teachers union, I should say, teachers union mentality uh, will probably set up a bunch of schools uh, that, that they believe in. And we can let to some degree the parents decide. Yes. Right? If their schools become popular, their schools will flourish. If their schools are, uh, aren't quality, and I suspect they won't be, then they won't flourish. They won't be copied. People won't send their kids there. They won't spend their money there. They won't spend their voucher there. And then they won't flourish. So by allowing choice, parents will eventually guide the system towards a higher quality education system. That doesn't guarantee there will never be a bad school, right? Diversity, choice, competition means that you're gonna have some bad schools, but allowing some bad schools is different to having a system that basically centralizes and forces bad schools on everyone. I just, I just jump in and say, I just say to people, you, you, well, I'm, I'm speaking from a Queensland perspective. John is absolutely right. The union controls the public school system mm. in Queensland. Period. Yes. They are even involved in the appointment of, you know, in a selection committee in a Queensland school for a for a position of a principal. There is a there is a teacher from the school, uh, a, a union rep who's on that committee. Um, the parents loved the independent public schools that we set up. The union hated it. And the Labor Party have been trying to dismantle it. But guess what? The parents love them. And mm. so they've had a great deal of difficulty in getting rid of them. Uh, now, I'm going to change it again. And just one last question before we finish uh, the main part of the show from David. And he says, if despite the best efforts, the financial institutions and capital markets may refuse to act logically, logically and not choose what is the cheapest, most reliable source, would you, for instance, approve of the government funding a nuclear plant on the basis that it could be privatised later? The market might choose unreliable and expensive otherwise. Look, I, I can understand the instinct people have with this. I understand this instinct even more when it comes to having, uh, I think Matt Canavan suggested the government get involved uh, in supporting uh, coal-fired power stations because everyone would be scared to do that. Uh, I can understand where that instinct's coming from because they have recognized a real issue. And that is the sovereign risk that is being created by a series of bad politicians from both sides of the, the political aisle, uh, constantly threatening to use their legislative fiat to shut down big investments. And if your big investment could be shut down at the whim of a, a dodgy politician chasing a vote, you're gonna be scared to, to put a lot of money into that. We actually address that in our energy policy. Part of our energy policy, we have, and so short answer is no, but we have a better solution. Uh, so we address that in our energy policy yeah, in that we believe uh, you should be liable to receive regulatory compensation. If you go ahead to set up a, a, a nuclear powered station once it's legal or a coal-fired power, coal power station once it's legal uh, and you've set it up, it's got a good business case and it's working and then a future government comes in and their regulation destroys your investment, they owe you compensation. Basically, it's a business equivalent of the movie The Castle. The Castle, they're trying to steal your house. If they steal your house, they have to pay you. Uh, and this is the same thing. If they functionally steal your business by undermining it through stupid regulation, they should have to compensate you. It does two things. A, it adds fairness back to the system. Uh, but B, it allows people to then invest with confidence. Mm. And you would have people going ahead. The idea that I understand some uh, markets are turning very woke, some capital markets at the moment, but the idea that every single rich person and every different, every single... Uh, financial institution and every different financial market will all go woke at the same time. I'm very skeptical of that. Mm -hmm. uh, all we need to do is accept that there's gonna be uh, some money that won't come near it, but some will. There's lots of international money floating around that would jump in on this if they could have the sovereign risk taken away from them. So we'll take the sovereign risk away and let the market decide. Yes. Well, gentlemen, it's been an interesting night again and talking about our fabulous Freedom Manifesto, which of course is on our website, ldp.org.au 
slash freedom. You can check it out and read it for yourself. Um, now we're going to end the official part of the show, but obviously for our live viewers here, please do hang around. We're going to bring in a couple more of the authors of our amazing Freedom Manifesto. So for those that are leaving us, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us again for Liberty Chat. Thank you very much, John Ruddick, John Humphreys and Campbell Newman. Thanks, Kirsty. Kirsty.